Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hemingway Jones Pen Show. Happy to have you all here tonight. Hello, and a special hello to all my members. Thank you for joining. If you'd like to join the channel, you can at, at www.youtube slash Hemingway Jones slash join. Lots of fun benefits, and um, I'd love to have you back there behind the curtain with us. So, so welcome, everyone. We have another very exciting and very special episode for you this evening. Tonight, we are going to be joined by a very special person, Mr. Brendan Schmidt from Atlas Stationers. Very good friend of mine. Welcome, Brendan, to the channel. Look at you. Let me take you in. How you doing? Oh, hold on. I think you might be muted. Let's try it again. All right. Try Can you it. hear me? Yes, yes, of course. There you are. How Excellent. Are you? How you Mr. Doing? Hemingway Jones, what a legend. It's good Thanks. to see you, my friend. You're entirely too kind. You know, it's good to see you. So we've been um, trying to bring different guests on, kind of um, introduce my people over here on YouTube. It's a whole different show over here, Brendan, than, than um, TikTok. Trying to give them different insights into the fountain pen business, into fountain pens in general. I thought we'd just have a fun conversation and just kind of make it more about, you know, what we're into and, and everything else so that they can uh, get some perspective. But I thought it'd be nice if maybe you could give us your background and the company's background. Take it away. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, first off, thank you for having me. It's good to see Bye. you as always. You too. Um, first thing I got to say, that intro was unbelievable. That was so sick. I loved it. Thank you. It's the old intro to my YouTube. I used to put it up before every video on YouTube, but you can track your metrics here. And like yeah, 40% of people would drop off before it finished, but it was <laughs> a lot better on the lives. So I've resurrected yeah. it. So thanks. Nice. Well, I enjoyed it. But yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. So my name is Brendan. Uh, my family owns Atlas Stationers in downtown Chicago. We're a fine writing and stationery shop here in the loop. Uh, my great grandfather started the company in 1939. So 83 years and counting. I'm pretty sure that's where we're at right now. But, uh, you know, we've been evolving, adapting, trying to share and spread the passion of fine writing, stationery, all that good stuff. So things are going good, man. That's fantastic. So that's, um, so fountain pens are like, well, stationary, really broader mm -hmm. and with more of an emphasis lately on fountain pens. It's just really mm -hmm. in your blood. You were brought up with this stuff. Yeah. So well, as you can see, I'm currently at the retail store right now. Yeah, just... So I kind of wanted to, to have a, a pretty authentic background and kind of give everyone watching a, a taste of kind of what we have to offer and kind of what our daily environment looks like. But yeah, growing up, you know, the, the store was significantly different. The business was different. Uh, I used to come down, you know, every so often on my, my school breaks and whatnot and uh, do such small tasks. But those tasks made me feel like I was honestly running the company. It could oh. be something as simple as like stamping envelopes or like return address labels. But I felt like I was doing the most. And then, you know, fast forward many moons later, um, post college graduation in 2018, joined the company and things have just been going really well. So that's fantastic. And it's funny because as a leader of a company, I'm sure you're back in part to stamping envelopes again, but like, <laughs> do it all now. Now it's, now it's all your responsibility. So, um, so that's mm -hmm. great. You, yeah, you graduate from Illinois state. If I yep. Remember. ISU, the Harvard of the Midwest brother. That's what we like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Rutgers, you know, it's like Harvard on the Raritan. So it's you know, the same thing. So, so good nice, for you. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. And um, one of the things I've been really curious about is like, you know, you've been a phenomenon over on TikTok. Um, your videos are a lot of fun. Um, you know, you and I've been following each other for a long time over there. And um, mm -hmm. how has that impacted your business? Sure. So first off, let me just address that. We never anticipated the TikTok page to grow as quickly as it did. Yeah, uh, you were well on TikTok before us, I think by a couple of years. And I remember I stumbled uh, across your page and it said the TikTok pen guy. I was like, oh, this guy's legit. Oh, and then, uh, yeah, you know, we started building the channel and a couple of videos went viral. We, we tried to ride the wave. And um, 
it's been pretty fun. I think we've learned a lot of how to showcase products and, and produce skits and entertainment for people who can't travel to our store physically, whether they're, um, you know, out in the suburbs or out of state. Um, but in terms of like the impact on the, the overall business, it's definitely produced a lot of good business, a lot of uh, recurring customers. We've met a lot of people who come travel to our store while they're visiting. They make it a point to stop by the shop. And uh, it's very rewarding, very humbling to see how, uh, you know, our network has expanded so quickly to now even meeting you and doing a YouTube live. So it's been exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's great. YouTube is interesting, mm -hmm. too. It's um. It's a little different over here. I, I feel it's um, I feel YouTube's a little bit more like you put in a certain amount of work, you get a certain amount of return where TikTok mm -hmm. you can put something up and it goes to like 4 million people. And you're like, how did that even happen? Well, let me try mm -hmm. that again. And then you do like something very similar and it, it only a thousand people see it. So it's, yeah. a, it's a little bit more predictive over here. And I feel like the people that engage certainly with my channel, the level is so high. I mean, the, the insights, the questions, the, you know, we'll, we'll be taking questions this evening. It's just really inspiring for me. I mean, a lot of my ideas for my videos come from the people that comment on videos. So mm -hmm. it's really been fantastic. So, but, you know, great to yeah. over here with that. So um, mm -hmm. we all are hyper focused on fountain pens, you know. In, in our side, my side, and my people that I represent, if I represent anybody. But you have a bigger business. I mean, it's a stationary business. I imagine you must, you probably supply copy paper to businesses downtown and whatnot. I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, how, what is the kind of percentage between what we do, which is the fountain pen stuff, and and the other stuff? Can you give us a sense of that? Yeah. Well, first off, uh, copy paper is not light. Uh, copy paper is very heavy, my friend. So uh, a few years back, pre-pandemic, we used to cater to all the big offices. So the majority of our business was office supplies. But then when COVID hit, we had to basically flip, hit a 180 and kind of try something new. Um, honestly, take a big risk, um, invest a lot in products such as fine writing instruments where uh, there's more of a controlled market, right? It's a hobby. It's personal use. It's not we weren't as relying on, we weren't relying on like big companies as much when, to be honest here in the loop, there's still a lot less people than there were pre pandemic. Right. So, um, yeah, I imagine honestly, any big business district with people working hybrid schedules. I mean, a lot of people don't come in Mondays. A lot of people don't come in Fridays, which those are the right days to work from home. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Extend the weekend. So totally understand that. But, um, you know, we used to offer free delivery services all throughout the loop. And uh, my mom, who works here as well, Mama T, she used to actually load up the mag liner with just cartons of paper and just start trucking them, running them all across the, the loop area. And sure. I got to tell you, she, she definitely she definitely uh, was handling a lot, but she loved it. Right. So, yes, it was strenuous work, but she got to go into all these amazing buildings with beautiful architecture on the inside and outside. And um, you know, we cater to a bunch of law firms and things like that. So um, that's basically what's changed. We don't do that anymore. We don't really offer office supplies just because, you know, you have a company like Staples who have bought out multiple other dealers locally and corporate on the corporate level. So um, we're happy that that type of physical work isn't as involved, uh, yeah. but we do carry reams of paper. So Okay. So, that, yeah, that makes sense. And so then in a way, fountain pens and the sort of finer writing instruments – was a great way for you to pivot during the last you know few years when the office mm -hmm. is or shut down it was a, a tremendous opportunity and there was a lot of growth there um mm -hmm. and you've certainly done fantastic with it so thank you thank you yeah the, the cool thing is you know with the office supplies uh obviously it's a necessity right but when you had the pandemic people were honestly just going to amazon you know they forget about their local office supply store that's been supporting their business for you know however many years and so we kind of understood that and when we changed we, we adapted and that's when we actually launched a brand new website well it's not new anymore we launched it like two weeks before the official pandemic hit um back in wow. early march of 2020 that's great time things just fantastic yeah thank heavens for that right Yep. Yep. And uh, we were not expecting to have it kind of grow as quickly as it did. But once we reached certain thresholds, we were kind of like, all right, wait a minute, you know, what's going on here? Is this kind of just an in the moment type of thing? Or are we doing something really good here that we should keep exploring? And 
well, you know, it's led us to where we're at now. Yeah, that's great. That's really fantastic. So I thought mm-hmm. it might be fun to kind of talk about some things, you know, I'm, I'm, re- I'm a banker, right? So I'm always thinking, yep. what is the segment of your business? How are you financing this? But it's probably more fun to talk about pens and uh, some of the stuff that you're seeing right now. And I, I thought it'd be mm-hmm. interesting maybe if you shared what's hot this holiday season or is it too early to tell? Yeah, so that's always a very popular question that we get, you know, with customers in store or online. So uh, I actually have a, a pretty nice setup here, just in case you were going to ask something along sure. those lines. You know, we all love show and tell. So, um, you know, feel free, show us some stuff and give us your thoughts. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. So when, when you get closer to the fourth quarter and holiday season, a lot of manufacturers and brands start releasing some of their seasonal items, right? Or their new releases to get ready for the holidays because we technically or typically see an influx of sales and whatnot. So um, what I have prepared here is kind of just a mix of items between newer releases and also things I prefer. Now, you're well aware that this is very subjective, right? The hobby is very subjective. There's no right or wrong way to collect or to purchase fountain pens or stationary, things like that. It's basically do your research, figure out what you like, and then roll with that. Um, The biggest release, which I'm sure you've seen this all over, this is one of the coolest items every year. I'm way behind on that too. I mean, that is awesome. The ink vent calendar. That is. Yep. Yep. It's a good value, right? It it ends up when you kind of weigh it all out, you're getting a tremendous value by buying that box. Yeah, so you get 25 different inks that haven't been released on the market yet from Diamine out of the UK, one of the premier ink sellers in the world, in my opinion. Um, so you get 24, I think it's like 12 or 15 milliliter bottles. And then the, the grand finale on day 25 is a 30 milliliter bottle. Um, this is always a hot commodity because it's like $115 or something like that. Um, but you're getting a ton of samples. Yeah, that's great. And so, wait, do, do you have one of these? Did you get one of these? No, I didn't. You know, and, and oh, yeah, I'm funny. Sometimes I just don't. I know every, everyone else, all the content folks are doing it. So I was yeah. kind of like, okay, maybe I won't do it. You, you know what I mean? Like I kind of zig when people zag. Yeah, the content it's great, aspect though. I of have. this. What? Yeah, well, well, don't do not do it necessarily for the content because it's exhausting. Yeah. We did it last year where we, we videotape every swatch and then you take it to a vote like on Instagram. Like, oh. hey, you know, if, if you like day one or day two more, We'll tally up the votes and then that ink will move on to day three. And, you know, we did kind of a tournament challenge. It produces a ton of content, but dude, it honestly is exhausting because there's so much to do. Uh, but you know what? It's time that we send you another package. I'm going to include one of these. Uh, I got to get you one of these. You need some Diamine ink in your life, my friend. You're too kind. You're right, though. Diamine is awesome. It's one of my favorite inks. And by the way, you can say Diamine Oxblood here. <laughs> on, on youtube just not on tiktok <laughs> can't, i can't say it i always have problems i'm always in tiktok jail i think i've told you that yeah before. Like they're always shadow banning me or, or whatever and i i don't know i think it there must be the way i say something must sound dirty or something i don't know what it is mm-hmm. but it, it happens mm-hmm. it's funny yeah there's no way to know i feel like you know I, as i'm learning the platform i mean it's literally just like as you mentioned one video for some reason gets five million views the next video gets 500 views yeah <laughs> Exactly. But we do it for our love. We know we don't do it for the views, you know? So yeah, but yeah. Oh, that's exciting. You know what? I think I see what's in your hand. It's, um, it's your custom color with Ferris wheel press and it's mm-hmm. iron or iron ore. Yep. So this is Atlas iron ore. So yeah, um, this is also it. something that's going to be sent your way, Mr. Hemingway oh, Jones, because time. we want you to have this, uh, and show some love all the way out on the Northeast. So are you familiar with any of the backstory on this at all? No, no. I mean, I, I was guessing it was tied with Chicago because I know you're very strong. All your custom stuff usually has something to do with Chicago, like the narwhal that you did mm-hmm. with the flag of Chicago. That's that's my guess. So why don't you tell us? There it is. Beautiful. Sure, sure. Oh, it's a beautiful pet. Really? Um, but yes. Yeah. And you know what? I got to tell you, every time we show that pen on TikTok, it always does so well. I mean, who doesn't like a good narwhal? Let's That's be awesome. honest. So, yeah. So the the project here that we did with Ferris Wheel Press, um, let me start by saying this is actually the first exclusive ink that we've ever co-designed, if that makes sense. Nice. So um, we, we have carried the products for about two years now, I want to say, and it's quickly become one of our 
most popular selling lines. I mean, you, I know you're good buddies with them or you, you have a few of their inks. Oh yeah. And, I was uh, a brand ambassador for them. I, I'm still a brand ambassador, but I get the way their program works. I got behind and then I got confused. And I, I wasn't <laughs> sure what I was supposed to do, but I do love them. And, and yeah, they're incredible bottles because a lot of me and the way I, I approach this hobby, it's about, the romance of it and how you feel when you write, like you kind of want to get into a mind space and Ferris mm -hmm. wheel press is one of those brands that really helps you there because it's such mm -hmm. a beautiful bottle, but go ahead, take it away. Yeah. So very detail oriented. Uh, the inks are very pretty. Um, a lot of different shading abilities with the inks or characteristics, sheening, okay. shimmering, and they contacted us and we kind of were in agreement that, hey, we should probably start working on something. So the process started about a year ago, a little bit longer than a year ago, in which we were trying to figure out how we can convey Atlas into an ink, right? Mm -hmm. So there's challenges in a sense, because as you mentioned, you know, with, with the, the Narwhal pen, it's the Chicago flag. We even have a, an exclusive Lamy with the Chicago stars. You probably can't see that. So we wanted to deviate away from something that we've been doing. And trying to figure out how that can translate into an ink color that would be popular and widely accepted was a little challenging. Now, fortunately, Ferris Wheel Press has an unbelievable design team and they just know exactly what to do and how to design their inks, their colors. So basically we kind of collaborated and I believe they were the ones saying like, hey, what about the, um, the building you're in? Because we're in a historic building, right? So the local government can't really make any changes around here. So we're very fortunate in that matter. Um, I think the building got put up in like 1875, shortly after the Chicago wow. fire. So it's one of the oldest post Chicago fire buildings standing in the loop all around us. Like if anywhere I look out the window, it's skyscrapers, Oh no kidding. you know, office spaces. Is it Art Deco yeah. skyscrapers or new skyscrapers or a little of both? A mix. Yeah. Mix of both. Mix of both. Um, you know, there's an architectural tour that I just did for the first time, uh, like two months ago where they take you on the boat all across the river. Dude, it's insane. And they discuss all of the design orientations and, and why it was designed this way. You would definitely love it if you I came and visited. I'm yeah. Gonna, oh, it's, a, it's amazing. Your door one day, you know, one of these days I'm going to head out there. Good, good. Well, I'll be here. I'll be here. So, um, and speaking of architecture, that kind of was a, a pinpoint to maybe we can show off Atlas in the ink based on the, the building that we have that represents us. So right outside our building, we have iron columns, right? We, we actually are one of the last buildings in the business district to have original iron columns. Oh. Um, for those of you watching, if you haven't seen the storefront, you can just Google Atlas stationers and you'll see them. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, and they were like, Hey, what if we, what if we made a black ink with maybe some blue undertone, maybe with like a red sheen, if it's oversaturated to represent, you know, maybe the, the, the color of the flag and maybe throw in some silver shimmer. We were like, oh my gosh, this is great. Everything you want in one ink. Yeah. And so um, that's the official color. Ooh, uh, I'm, that iron ore, yeah. Atlas iron ore. I'm saying that because people are asking for the name. So it oh, yeah. have some shimmer to it. It looks like silver, like a silver yep. highlight. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. So I'll do my best to show off the bottle, but basically the bottle itself is actually representative of our storefront. So oh. when they were designing the bottle, they were considering how can we merge Ferris wheel press with Atlas stationers. So it's our storefront. And then they actually included some of their art deco, their, their characters that, that they have in all of their ink bottles or like their, um, what are they called? Easter eggs, I guess, where they kind of hide yeah, things. Exactly. Yeah. So we have our storefront on the bottle, which is beautiful. And then up top, um, is actually the train, the, the L line. So for those of you who don't know, Chicago is basically a grid system that is kind of bounded by a big rectangular above ground train called the L. Oh, and so we are literally right under one part of the L. So I hear the train go by, you know, every, oh, every two minutes. Yeah, you don't catch that in your videos. So yeah, you know, luckily you don't, but if I'm, if I'm like flipped around, if I was facing or if the camera was facing the window, you see the train roll by in like every video. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That so, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's been exciting. Brian Schmidt tells us it's shipping this Friday. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, we actually, uh, are going to be opening it up for pre-order. So if, if people are interested, you can go to our website and get ready to, 
to lock it in and then we'll start officially launching it this upcoming Friday. So just in time for the holiday season. So how was the process like? Was it, did you describe it to them or did you say, yeah, you know, we want something a little more dark so that it's, uh, <laughs> has a lot of contrast on the page. Plus we want to tie it into the building. Did they give you swatches back and forth before you agreed to it? Was, is that kind of how it works? Yeah. So they provided multiple color arrangements, right? And so for them, I'm sure that process is a lot more tedious than, you know, just them sending us the swatches, you know, and our end we're like, oh, wow, there's so many options, right? Sure. For them, they have to probably mix it and come up with the, the formula yes. and do a bunch of testing, right? So they sent us a few different options. And then uh, basically, the, the color came through and we instantly loved it. And it was pretty close to, I don't know if you've seen the Roaring Patina Black by them, um, but that was one of the best selling inks we've ever had. It, it's truly unbelievable. So this ink is, is similar in some situations, but the bigger difference is within the shimmer. It's not gold like in the Roaring Patina. It's silver. So it offers a nice contrast. So That is nice. So um, mm -hmm. you personally, is there um, do you have a limit where you won't put a shimmer ink in a pen? Like a nice, limit? nice. Yeah, that's a that's a phenomenal question. Uh, Cause you so, don't okay, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say that when people come in and ask that question, it, it, I always tell them the same thing. You know, as long as you take care of your fountain pen, there's not much that can go wrong, right? If you're using an extra fine nib, obviously there's a higher chance for the shimmer to clog right. um, the the nib. And I don't know if everyone's aware of shimmer. It's like little you know, little specks like flake inside the ink to give you kind of that. Yeah. Very small. Yeah. And I think very small the problem is if, if I can speak and feel free to contradict me if I say anything that's wrong, but I feel like if it's lying in one position for too long and it settles and then you get all of it rushing to a nib, that's a fairly fine flow into a fairly mm -hmm. fine nib, you can get into some trouble. So personally, I, I restrict it to pens that are wide and easy to clean. It's just mm -hmm. because it's like, why, why create a problem for yourself? And we all write with exactly. them, right? Yeah. I mean, they're fun inks. Let's be honest. They're Absolutely. fun inks. I mean, I'm sure we all use just the simple like blue ink or black ink. So it, it's nice to have a bunch of different color options. Um, you know, I actually pulled some of my favorite shimmering inks. This Ooh. is Dominant Industries, Autumn Forest. I mean, these are, these are so pretty. Yeah. Another wearing gold. Um, a brand new dominant industry ink. And as you mentioned, um, the broader the nib, the better. Now, if you clean out your pen very frequently, good for you. I'd recommend doing it before you fill up your pen every time. I mean, right. why not? It doesn't take that long. Go look at Hemingway Jones's video on TikTok on how to clean your fountain pen. It's perfect. Unbelievable. There's one here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but on YouTube. So, sure. Oh, and Also, good. I think importantly, and a lot of people miss this, even before you fill it for the first time, if anything, sometimes that's the most important time because you get a new pen and occasionally there's residue from when they tested it or it's uh, got a little oil from manufacturing. You got to clean that out mm -hmm. there because you might get your new pen and it's a bit of a buzzkill if you go to write with it and it has false starts or it's not flowing well. And it's not the pen's fault sometimes. It's just the process that it went through before it arrived at your door. Yep. Yeah. Actually cleaning the pen out, flushing it out before you ink it up probably like resolves like 70% of any issues that may occur out of the box. Uh, brands like Lamy, you know, it, any Lamy pen you get, if you take out the nib from the feed, mm -hmm. you'll notice there's actually blue residue because they dip test every uh, nib as part of their quality control. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, going back to the shimmer, what we tend to recommend too is like, you're right, it'll settle, right? So like if you have, if you have shimmer ink in your pen and you leave it like this, it'll settle horizontally. If you leave it like this, it'll settle on the bottom. So a great word, uh, I guess, is agitating the, the ink bottle or the pen, you know, just give it like a quick spin, um, you know, maybe back and forth a little bit, because you're right, if it all kind of flows down at once, there's a higher chance it, it gets stuck in the feed. Oh, yeah. Maybe it is a pain to clean, maybe not. Um, but, you know, everyone's got to try a shimmer ink. However, I will say you, you asked me kind of what is my limit? Um, I wouldn't be putting this type of ink in like, you know, $5,000 Machia pens or like, you know, I have a, a David Oscarson right in front of me that I thought would be cool to show off, you know, something like of this value, Damn. I would probably refrain from 
you know, a very permanent ink or an iron gall ink, a shimmer ink, just because, you know, with how delicate pens are, especially at this value, no I'd be a little more careful. There. What's up? No base state blue. No base state blue. Yeah, that would be the quickest way to literally ruin anything yeah. that you have. So <laughs> that's awesome that it's got its own reputation. Like it's like it built its own notorious rep. And the Bay State is Massachusetts, so I guess it it, it, does, it makes sense. So, so we have a question from Simon: How your family chose the name Atlas? Sure, yeah, great question. Uh, so, way back when um, there was no internet, right? There, there really wasn't. I, I guess it might be safe to say there was not much phone usage, um, but there was big old like like yellow pages or like the big old books where you can list your business inside. Uh, that huge book. I, what do they call? I don't even know what they're called. Atlases. Oh. Or atlases are world. Oh yeah. World maps. A world map. Yeah. Um, that was just called the. Yeah. In those days, but. Okay. Sure. So imagine like the big yellow book. So they were road um, atlases, and they sometimes had directories in them too. Sure. So funny enough, wasn't wasn't named after a road atlas. It was more so from the um, the, the big yellow books where you can have your listings in there, sure. and so. Um, you know, my family's last name is Schmidt. A lot of people think our last name is Atlas. It's not. Uh, the name came from my great grandfather was pretty smart. And he's like, okay, well, what letter comes first in the alphabet? Well, A. So it's going to be closer to the front of the listing. So and then he came up with Atlas, which is a, a pretty sick name, honestly. It suits Chicago because Chicago mm -hmm. is known as being an art deco city. And mm -hmm. Atlas is kind of like an Art Deco figure. You see him a lot. I, I, I'm trying to remember if he's in the lobby of the Empire State Building or if it's Rockefeller Center. My my mm -hmm. memory is slipping on that one, but it's kind of that kind of icon. I know that's New York, but it's the kind of iconography you associate with Art Deco. So I, mm -hmm. I think it suits you guys well. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it kind of represents the longevity of our business. And even the iron columns, you know, that show you how long our building's been here, it kind of creates this idea that atlas has been very durable very sturdy throughout the existence and uh it ties in pretty nicely to at least what i think what we're doing here yeah absolutely and you're the new blood you're the next generation mm -hmm. and beyond so that's a tremendous yeah. responsibility yeah i can't imagine uh, my dad would have ever started on tiktok <laughs> what's he think? he loves it though uh, does he has yeah. he been in it oh yeah I, I don't remember ever seeing him in one no, you know, he was in one of them way early on when uh, we recorded him. Uh, we gifted him a Paniter Psycho for his birthday, and I wanted to get his reaction because he, he was wanting one of those pens for a while. And I was like, all right, you know, let's get a nice, nice reaction video. Um, you know, he's definitely one of my biggest supporters for sure. You know, you know we have the office space in back, and I'll, I'll just walk back there, and I'll hear my voice or, like, the songs I use in the videos, and he's just watching them all, digging it, so – very appreciative of, of the support and also kind of just allowing me to just jump in and try it. My brother and I were talking a lot about social media the past few years and how we can kind of have a, a broader reach. And he was actually pushing me to try out TikTok. I was super against it because I knew very well how addictive it is. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I, I can't get on there. I can't make a personal account, you know, let alone the business account. And what do you know? It's our biggest uh, platform. So. That's fantastic. We have a pretty good following on Instagram too. And I should mm -hmm. mention that to everyone. Follow Atlas Stationers on TikTok if you're on there or on Instagram. I, mm -hmm. I really like your Instagram. I like the static shots too because you can, mm -hmm. really, you can really drink them in and study them when they're static. You mm -hmm. know what's in there and everything else. So that's pretty brilliant. I think it complements your TikTok nicely. Thank you. Yeah, both the videos and the photos offer two different, I guess, appearances, right? Like mm -hmm. when you're doing a video, sometimes you're showing off the product really quickly or you might overlook a detail. But when you have a still photo, it really gives the, the viewer a chance to kind of sit there for a second and take it in and really see the details. Um, my favorite photos to do are the ones where I just walk right outside the store. I'll walk a few blocks around and I'll just hold the pen up, you know, get the Sears Tower in the background. It's great, man. I love when you fill up the, you use the vac fill all around town too. That's a yeah, fun that's fun thing. Yeah, it's super fun. So um, how's your experience been with the comments? You get a lot of wacky comments on TikTok? You get people attacking you or anything, you know, as I do? So, so as funny as that, that is, it, it started a lot more when I had blonde hair, right? So <laughs> blonde I hair. have blonde. Nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I dyed it last year and um, for a Halloween costume, I was from Scooby-Doo, which was awesome. And then one of my favorite characters from uh, a cartoon show I watched when I was younger. But when I got on TikTok, I had blonde hair and it was almost highlights at that point. And so people were just saying some pretty, uh, pretty interesting things. But you know what? If you choose to put yourself out there, uh, you can't let it get to you. And yeah. there's a lot more good than bad out there. If that's how you'd like to perceive it. So nowadays, it's it's like it's like who would buy that five thousand dollar pen like no no way you guys sell that you know no way this is i could get this for ten dollars on aliexpress or amazon i'm like all right well you know drop the link <laughs> well you know that's the problem too because and we discuss that a lot on this channel it's all about value and mm -hmm. where where you place value and it's hard mm -hmm. for someone who's not into a hobby to sort of say to them well Writing is my life. If I spend a thousand dollars on a pen, it has tremendous value to me because I enjoy the experience of it and the history mm -hmm. and that unique experience of writing with that pen. They're like, well, you could get a ballpoint for 25 cents. That's true for anything. You know, mm -hmm. there's Yeezy sneakers that are a thousand dollars. Maybe that's a bad example right now, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how much they're worth now. So <laughs> indeed, indeed. But, well, you know, people are saying stuff like that and they're typing it on a thousand dollar phone, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yep. well, where you place value and in your interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the thing is with, with, with cellular devices like smartphones is people don't even look at that as an accessory anymore. They kind of look at it as just a part of them, right? Like oh, yeah. you always have it. it. A lot of people are so hooked that if they don't have their phone nearby, they kind of panic. Where is it at? I mean, I do that too sometimes, sadly. So it, it's hard for people to kind of realize that, well, technically you don't need a smartphone. You can go get like a Nokia, you know, go phone. Really. All you need to do is text or call people. You don't need all these functions. Oh, right. I so flip phones all the time. Um, yeah. Were you, a, did you have a razor or like a Blackberry? I don't know why I pin you as one of those types of people. No, I was an early adapter to the iPhone. Sure, Before that sure. I had the Nokia that was really easy to text with. Do you remember the one yeah. you text with, with, with your thumb? Yeah, is that where like each text. each number had multiple letters? Yes, and it was really good at predictive <laughs> text back in the day. Oh, excuse me. Um, we have a yeah. question from Edwin asking if the iron ore is available at the store on Friday. Yep, yep. So we'll have uh, we'll probably make a little display out in our our table, you know, behind me or somewhere. So we'll definitely have a lot of bottles ready to go. So yeah. thank you for showing interest. That's really exciting. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interest. I'm looking at some of the comments, and I, it looks beautiful. So, so that's really good. Thank stuff. you. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have some other questions for you, too. Like, um, what do you think about how the – and I don't know why it's controversial, but I think in some circles it is – where a pen brand will source nibs from, you know, Yovo or Brock sure. or whatever. Actually, mm -hmm. Schmidt's made by Yovo, isn't it? Like, they're really the same company, aren't they? I imagine that a lot of these products are made in the same or, you know, close by factories. So, you know, Schmidt, Bach, and Yovo are all German. So right. who's to say they're not that close in, in terms of geographic location, right? Indeed, indeed. But, but so, you know, I think a lot of people expect a gold nib to be made in-house when in mm -hmm. Pen companies aren't necessarily goldsmiths, you, you know? Sure, sure. What, what do you think about? Do you think there's a certain expectation at a certain price point where it, something should be made in-house? Or do you think it's almost like the watch world where if you get a nice Swiss movement in a case, then it's that much more serviceable and, and, and actually good for the user? Yeah, so that's a very fair question. Um, you know, you got to look at it as one, how, how are these nibs being perceived and received by the end user? Like if I'm being honest with you, most companies use Yovo. And I imagine that's because over time they've gravitated towards that manufacturing company because of how consistent they are and their performance, right? Yeah. So a lot of these manufacturers didn't just randomly say, I'm going to choose Yovo as the producer of my nibs. Obviously, Yovo was doing something that enticed these, you know, pen brands to go to them. Um, I don't think that one is necessarily better than the other. I kind of view it as, you know, with nibs, they're, they're so funky because 
some nibs are very smooth. Some nibs are very stiff, right? Some people like the feedback where it kind of scratches the paper a little bit. Some people like the buttery feel. Now, some manufacturers might offer better, you know, better suiting nibs than others for your preference, but you can't look at it as in like which one's better. Like going to the gold versus steel nib, at a certain point, love, you're right about that. I, I love that. I, I really want to go there. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. So go ahead. Yeah, no, and it's fair. I mean, it, it, the, the general consensus is like, if I'm paying around $200, I should get a gold nib. That, I'd say that's about the price point. You know, that's like where, that's the cutoff, right? Sure. Um, but really what a gold nib offers is more than likely a smoother writing experience. And over time, since it's more malleable than steel, it'll mold to your handwriting. So if we each, the idea is if we each got the same pen, and we compare it three years from now, it might be slightly different, more accustomed to you know our, ha- our writing angles and our handwriting in general, yeah. which is great. It makes it a lot more of a personal experience. But I don't necessarily think that at $200, you need to get a gold nib, right? right? Because there's so many other features of a pen than just the nib. There is the, the body of the pen, the size, how right. rare a pen is. This is the brand new Narwhal. We just got it in today. This is about 190. Um, you know, it's a steel nib. Um, you know, this is this is the Platinum 3776, which I'm sure you know a lot about. Uh, this pen's amazing. Yeah, that's a great pen. You know, yep. it's a good point. I think that if you were to create a chart for each pen and you had steel and gold and you started to um, give them different scores on the basis of smoothness, on the basis of... Um, malleability or, or whatever it is that the distribution would surprise you it's certainly not mm-hmm. there are gold nibs that are rough there are steel nibs that are butter smooth i mean look at twi yep. every twisby nib is just it, it fools you that it's like gold and then mm-hmm. i think personally gold has a character that steel doesn't have so in most cases you can do things with gold you cannot do with steel it doesn't mean that brands are doing them. And I'm saying something like the uh, Peniter's uh, Quill Nib. Um, it'd be very tough to do that in steel. It's right. one of my favorite pens. I got a whole tray of them right here, man. Oh, look at you. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's such a, an interesting writing experience. I don't know if you could replicate that with a steel nib, but then mm-hmm. I've seen steel nibs on vintage pens that behave like that. So I guess it's theoretically possible, but not very common in a modern mm-hmm. pen. So, yeah, I but think a lot of modern day pen. Mind. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, all good. I mean, that, that's a very valid point. I think I think a lot of current like modern manufacturers actually try to replicate vintage pens um, for some reason. You know, and I'm not in the vintage game at all, so I can't really speak on behalf of it. Uh, that's a whole nother animal in terms of knowing, you know, each pen, each year, the parts used. Uh, but from what I hear and from what I've seen and used, some of those vintage nibs, man, are unbelievable with the flex capabilities, how soft they are. Oh, yeah. And it just makes me wonder, like, there must have been something that was being done back then that can't be replicated now, or maybe it's not cost effective for these modern brands to try to achieve and recreate because you would think that like, if you go ask anybody who collects pens, everyone's got that one vintage pen. They're like, yeah, my vintage Parker 51 is fire. You know, my vintage safe Schaefer, right? right. Well, so I don't know. Ew. The wa- had a, I have a Watcherman um, 52 and a half. I'll bring it with me when we meet so that you can use it. It's like painting with a paintbrush. Mm-hmm. It got such an interesting, it goes fine to double broad. And mm-hmm. it, you feel like you're painting your words. It doesn't That's crazy. flex. It goes back and forth like this. Like it's bizarre. The only modern mm-hmm. pen that I've ever used that feels like that is the uh, Mont Blanc Egyptomania. It behaves mm-hmm. just like that without the line variation, which is. Yeah, dude, you love that pen. <laughs> because of that, it's so yep. weird. It's such a different pen. And I respect that. Yeah. You know, and yeah, that's very fair. It, yeah, and it's kind of very outdated in how it's made. It's slimmer, it's smaller, you know, it's mm-hmm. interesting. So Yeah, you know, it's so funny. Based on your content, you can tell which which items you prefer a little bit. I love it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Like like which ones? 
So what I've been seeing a lot of recently is the October fest from uh like you've been enjoying that flex nib they just they've just put out which i haven't written with it yet i gotta actually yeah. try it. i don't know why i haven't yet um you it, like that one though don't you i really do and it's not mm. super soft it's very mm -hmm. firm but it does the job and the way i mm -hmm. i talk about it and i think this thursday thank you for giving me a segue so in two days here on youtube is my review of the oversize uh the novu blue no, no. Yep. Yeah. How do you pronounce Novo it? Novo Blue. Thank I think it's Novo. I have trouble with that. Um, there's some words. I have a yeah. little bit of a speech impediment. There's some words I get tripped up on. And that's one of yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's and why it's spelled weird. Idiot <laughs> on it. It's great. But it has that flex nib. And what it's great for is like emphasis. You can like mm -hmm. really like carve down on the, um, on like your downstrokes. And, and that's definitely a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people nowadays, um, like the, the community is shifting, like going back to the inks, we're seeing a lot more people get into the more fun inks, the colorful inks, the, the shimmering, the sheen, right? Same thing with collecting fine writing instruments. You're seeing a lot of people gravitating towards more colorful items or yeah. the demonstrator items, like, you know, the Twisbees, as you mentioned, it, it, it's cool to see the trends and kind of how things do eventually go full circle. But Right now, you know, the internal fillers are hot, the, the stub, the flex nibs are hot, the, the fun inks. Yeah, well, I think people are looking for variety. They're looking for something different. I just got one in um, for YouTube that I'm doing. I'm editing right now a whole review mm -hmm. on it. It's from Conway Stewart. And it's sure. the first one I ever had for them. Do you want to see it? Of course. Okay. What kind of question I is that? I haven't shown it yet on YouTube. So there's going to be a whole... Um, review coming up and I'm not going to show it at length, but I'm going to show a little bit. I gasped when sure. I saw this because I felt like I was looking at something brought back through time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Look at this thing. Do you see that lever fill? How many lever fill pens are there out there these days? <laughs> Let's That's rephrase that to how many working lever fills are there? <laughs> <laughs> well, it works brilliantly and you know, yeah. it's just, it's just gorgeous. It has the, the vintage writing on it, the way that they always have done it. So wow. really spectacular. So, How did you obtain that, if you don't mind me asking? I don't mind you asking. They sent it to me. It's also my first ah, sick. content here on YouTube. So I'm really excited to um, do it justice. So I'm editing a video right now that has some history. It's, it's the Churchill. The, the mm -hmm. model is called the um, Churchill Honey Noir lever oh interesting yeah yeah so 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 that's a modern day pen then inspired oh, yeah. by the oh yeah oh that's, what? that's what so that's what freaked me out about it because, that is kind of odd like even seeing the pictures once i got it in person and i took i was like this doesn't look right like this looks like they have a time machine you know mm -hmm. and it's impressive it, it really is and it's um well, I'll do the full review soon, but it's it's an interesting pen. There's a lot to say about it, so it's a uh, it's gonna be a yeah. Video. Looking forward to hearing it. Thanks, man. Yeah. So the the reason why I made the joke about you know rephrasing to you know like lever filling pens that work right. are because of the fact that a lot of vintage pens you know you'll go out and buy it and you can't fill it because like the sack inside is busted and it's so challenging to try to figure out who sources those like little tiny parts and. It's just a pain, man. It's a pain. But once you get one that works, if you got it all, you know, refurbished, they're, they're gems, man. I have a couple. The Watchman 52 and a half that I mentioned is one. And I mm -hmm. do have a vintage Conway Stewart that is one. But anytime they've broken on me or whatever, I just send them out to be fixed. I don't even try. You can do it yourself, mm -hmm. but I'm not that handy. It's tedious. I mess it up. Yeah. But one mm -hmm. of the other things is you can't use caustic ink in those. But you shouldn't use caustic ink in anything. And it's hard to get the pH value of inks. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's funny because sometimes I get critics that will say, like, I can't believe you use water in your pen. And it's like, they're full of ink. <laughs> and you're worried about the water when you're cleaning it? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if you know anything about pH, as I'm sure you do. Yeah. Like, water is sort of neutral, you know? I mean, maybe yeah. you have problems with like minerals in your water or 
some place. Yeah, like, you must have that like Chicago River, or, like Mississippi River water. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's clean though. I'm sure it's clean. I'm just joking, but yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I would want a balanced uh, ink or something in a vintage pen for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so I tend to use really gentle ones. Um, mm-hmm. What are your best selling inks? Is it because you would think? I mean, if I had to guess, right? Mm-hmm. I would say, I would say that it's probably something more on the generic side would be the best selling, like a Waterman Blue. And I hate to call Waterman mm-hmm. Blue generic because it sits on my desk at work. Like I love Waterman, nice. but it's kind of generic. But it's mm-hmm. a great ink for like what is it, like eight bucks or something, right? It's, it's a, They're pretty inexpensive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I am I close to being right? Uh, I would say that's actually one of them. I think that's generally accepted as like the most balanced and safest ink out there. That and like Aurora Blue and like maybe an older like Schaefer Blue. Um, I would say people who use incredibly old or incredibly high end fine writing instruments will gravitate towards an ink like that. Also, a lot of people who tune nibs or maybe they um, grind them like Nibmeisters, they'll use Waterman ink a lot just because it's it's so balanced, it's so consistent you know that it's not the ink's problem. You know, that's a constant variable in a sense, right? So you know it's either the notebook or the nib at that point. Oh, yeah. um, Waterman's up there. Um, I had to pull this one because I figured uh, I figured that that would be a, a topic oh, yes. of conversation Come tonight. Packing. Yes. That's one of them for sure. I use that. I, have you heard me speak about Compecky? How I've had pens that I thought were bad writers, just – Mm-hmm. Flow starters, um, skipping, all that. Put Conpecky in there and never had another issue with it. Yep. Yep. And it's a gorgeous blue, honestly. It's perfect blue. And Yamabuda works the same way, but you have to be in the mood. Yamabuda is a lot. Yeah. Oh, it's a pretty it's a pretty color. So Yamabuda and Conpecky are for sure the top two sellers of the Iro Shizuku line by Pilot. Um, to name off a, a, another couple, which is going to be awesome to say this live, uh, Diamine, Writer's Blood, and Ox Blood. Yeah. Those are, are for sure um, heavy hidden inks as well. Um, uh, right now, you know, and, and we try to show all of all of our brands love, uh-huh. right? So uh, I like to try to be very inclusive. But right now, I actually think our two current top selling brands, Ferris Wheel Press oh, wow. and Waringal. Yeah. Hidden. Mm-hmm. Well, I like so. wearing goals. I've been saying wearing jewel. Oh, hey, sounds good to me, honestly. As long as we know what you're talking about, it works, right? <laughs> I mean, the first thing I would say to my supplier would be like, how do you say that? And then I'd mispronounce it anyway, because um, some of the fun of watching my videos here on TikTok and on YouTube is to hear me say things like four different ways, because I, do, <laughs> I, do, I don't know why. Uh, John Manuel is asking yeah. if you guys do catalogs, or are you purely online? I mean... Are the days of paper over or do they live on? Mm-hmm. So we used to do catalogs. Um, we used to get whole um, pallets of them, actually, and we would store them in back and run them to all the local businesses. Sure. Uh, but we do, yeah, we don't do those anymore. Everything is just on our website, atlasstationers.com. Everything you see behind me and, well, all the pens in front of me that you can't see, uh, all are listed with proper photos, descriptions, all that good stuff. So if you're able to access the Internet, uh, you know, check it out. It's great. I use your website when I do research for my article. Oh, good. Or my YouTube's. Um, most every YouTube video also has an article now over on stridewise.com. So I'm writing mm-hmm. articles as well, which is kind of fun. It's like a different angle. And even a 15 minute YouTube doesn't have the information you can put in a 2000 word article. So mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. interesting. Uh- I'm going to have to take a prediction on, you know, what you're going to write about next and like leave you some funny like sentences or like jokes inside of our descriptions. Now that I know you're using our website for uh, the resources, which is great. That's what we want. Honestly, you know, we want our website to provide as accurate information as possible. Um, You know, the stock photos sometimes might look different than the in-person photo. So we're making a rolling transition. Uh, I'm sure you've you've seen Alvin on our channel quite a bit. Um, He's a fantastic photographer so you know we're, we're trying to really capture what the product looks like in person because sometimes maybe the stock photo isn't as accurate so between updating our photos and trying to make sure the the description contains like hey is it a standard international cartridge converter 
what type of nib is it? What type of material? It's just, we're trying to have a platform built to where you don't have to purchase as blindly as you might think you have to, um, you know, since you're not able to hold it or try it out in store. Yeah, that's, so, that's trying this research, resource route. Mm -hmm. So Simon was asking what your EDC pen is. All right, so that's you knew it was coming. Another fair question. I knew it was coming, so I, I got my case here. No. Uh, you know, my collection is pretty small. I have a couple pens that I obviously prefer more than others, but I don't really walk around with a fountain pen as often because my role here it, it's a little bit of everything, right? I kind of look at myself as like a flex operator, in a sense. Like I, I manage the retail store um, with Therese, my mother. Um, I'm in back trying to help out with the the order polling, the shipping. Um, doing the social media. So my office is like the, my, my desk is the entire store, the entire office space in fact. So I'm running around a lot, right? So I don't really use a fountain pen at work. So, and the reason why I'm, I'm going to show you my work pen is because, you know, I'm here way too, way too often. <laughs> of course. So and you have to tell the majority of, too. yeah, say that again. I'm sorry. The case. I'm sure people are going to want to know what case that is. It looks like a uh, is it a Girologio or is it a, um, yep. You tell yeah, me. it's a Girologio. Yeah. So, um, fantastic case. We actually recently got in a shipment. Um, I just have to add them all to our website. So coming soon folks, very, very well priced, very high quality stuff right yeah, here. Good stuff. And I love that interior, the plaid. That's oh, it's fantastic. beautiful. I use it's classy, man. Because I shelve them. They're shelved behind me. Oh, sure. Sure. With that amazing book collection. I love it. Thanks, I love it. So, okay. So to the, the question in regards to my EDC. So um, Mr. Hemingway Jones, I'm sure you're familiar with our retro 51s that we've designed, right? So we've also collaborated and we've designed our own pens in correspondence to Chicago and a theme. Um, so my go-to pen is a retro 51, which are called tornadoes. Um, they're the capless roller balls. I like roller balls a lot because of how smooth they are. It's, it's water-based ink rather than paste. Uh, my favorite one, probably the most used is the Great Chicago Fire. I'm mm. not sure if the camera's picking it up. So no. I, I bring this one with me like everywhere um, in my backpack and everything. But my favorite design, and my brother and I were talking about this, is the uh, Century of Progress, which is very Art Deco. Wait, Truly. what am I doing here? There we go. So I use those um, in terms of being around the office. Uh, my favorite pen of all time, and this is where people I'm sure will be a little bit more happy with my answer because it's a fountain pen, sure. um, is the Pelican Stone Garden, which I, I'm sure you and I have talked about many times. Yeah. This pen, you know, everyone has their preferences and, and what they like, right? This pen, for some reason, is just my all-time favorite. It, I mean, the performance of Pelicans, amazing. What is the that? Look. Marble, is that? cellulose so um i believe it's cellulose acetate so it's not celluloid so a lot of pens nowadays are made of cellulose acetate which is right. as close to celluloid as you can get right this platinum is actual celluloid but the cost of it's going to be a lot higher right because yep. the material is is not used anymore well very very slim in terms of uh right. who uses them but this is the M800. Uh, do you own a Pelican? I can't remember. I, I have an M200. I have an M600 Red Tortoise that's made of the same mm -hmm. material. It's just slightly smaller. Okay, sure. The Red Tortoise, that one came out actually within the past like, couple years, right? Yes. My wife bought it for me last, not yeah. last May, the May before. Please. That pen's really pretty. That's a great yeah. pen. Yeah, it's nice. Thanks. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So the M800 is my favorite of all time. And then my first fountain pen, just in case this question was coming up, uh, was from my brother, um, my older brother, Brian, that is the vice president here. He gave me the Platinum on Platinum Cross Peerless, uh, uh -huh. which is just such a, a baller pen. I love it, man. It makes me feel very important, if you will. <laughs> very nice cross. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. I wish I had mine. Did you ever hear the story about my first fountain pen? um refresh me i feel like i have i don't know I though i snapped it in half oh what <laughs> like i had no idea how to write with it it was a waterman and it, and i i wish i knew which model but it was very slim and remember this is like 94 or something mm -hmm. and i've used them before but they were other people's this was like the first one i owned 
and I pressed too hard and I just snapped it right where the threads were in the section. Oh no, and I'm sure your heart dropped. <laughs> I really did. And I have the pieces somewhere. I'm hoping one day I'm going to find them because I know I didn't throw them away. They're in a box somewhere. Yeah, you should call Waterman and just be like, hey, can I can I use the warranty on this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? See if they could do something like that. Uh, well, I'm really sorry to hear. You know what, though? That makes for a pretty good story. I'm it's sure up. you're not surprised. It's yeah. Up. And yeah. it's like, you know, people think because you have a somewhat of a platform that you're like perfect, like fountain pen guy. And it's like, no, I've made every mistake that you yeah. can, that you can think of. So... You know. I've broken a few myself. Don't tell <laughs> <Right>. anyone. <laughs> sincerely, sincerely. And I've seen some of the really pricey stuff you've been showcasing. And mm -hmm. those are like gift pens, right? So, and why don't you tell my audience a bit about those? Yeah, well, uh, look at once that. you reach certain what? levels of uh, price point, you look. start getting into – um, you know, certain levels of design yeah. that aspects makes and domania look like a slacker. Look at that thing. Yeah, this thing's crazy. So this is the, the brand new King Tut pen from Visconti. True. Um, we just got it in and it's one of the craziest shells I've ever seen. It's the sarcophagus. Um, and it comes on this really cool wooden stand. So at this price point, you know, you're, you're getting a, a beautiful presentation in addition to obviously the fine writing instrument, having some very unique characteristics but a lot of people you know going back to like the gold versus steel nib like this pen has a gold nib right but let's say it had a steel nib and it was five thousand dollars you're also paying for the design and the story involved in creating this pen um i know it's going to be a little challenging to kind of see all the details but um across pretty well if people are watching on a television i think they'd be able to see that that looks like inlaid stone around yeah it like lapis yeah so i'm pretty sure i mean don't quote me on this it's brand new and i haven't really looked too much into it um i just saw it actually in person for the first time uh, on monday but i'm pretty sure it's like enamel and then um, um the snake right here yeah. that, i think that's a cobra yeah. um that's actually hand done i'm pretty sure that's hand done so it's just crazy like yeah that's amazing Mm -hmm. So this, I don't know if, if, uh, if my brother's watching Brian, he might be able to, to quote us here. Um, oh, never mind. It says right here. So there's a hundred pieces worldwide. Wow. So yeah, we've got number five, which is pretty, I like getting the low numbers. Exactly. And that's a rare pen for a very rare collector. Like personally, any pen I own, I write with. Yeah. 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 And as you should, honestly, but you know what, everyone has different ways they build their collection and you shouldn't be restrained towards what other people do building their own collection. Or one thing I also like to suggest is like reading forums or, or following certain accounts can sometimes be misleading just because they might be presenting certain preferences that they enjoy, or maybe they had a bad experience with the pen and then they don't really suggest it to others. I try to encourage people to have a very open and neutral mind because let's say you get, you know, uh, I don't want to use any brand that, that we carry, but like, okay, let's say like this pen brand from Atlas, right? Mm -hmm. You get it and it's not good out of the box. You might have a sour taste, but then maybe you just got a defective one, which can happen. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it's tough. I like telling people, you know, give every brand a chance, go to a, a pen show or, uh, a pen shop if there's one located near you and try things out you know i'm sure have there been things that that you've owned that maybe you didn't like at first and then it grew on you or, or vice versa oh absolutely i mean there's nibs that i have to work on um i got in mm -hmm. a lot of trouble you you that was a very loaded question uh that you brought up and i mm -hmm. want to address a lot of it because it's fantastic and, and i think it's valuable to people listening i got in trouble recently i did a review of the jinhao x159 which is basically mm -hmm. a um a duplicate of the mont blanc 149 at a much mm -hmm. lower price point but the one that i got was a dud it, it wrote hard mm -hmm. it was like ridiculously scratchy so i did a little work i i use my um i keep a, a loop and I, sure I don't want to tell you guys what I did because I don't want you to try it and then mess up your pens. <laughs> I, I got it to write a little bit more flowy, right, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, working on it. And I've been writing with it quite a bit. I leave it out on my desk and I do reach for it. And it's starting to break mm -hmm. in now. Um, but I did my review and I have to tell the truth. 
Like I, I'm just that kind of guy. And um, there were people in my comments, well, you know, you just hate Jin Hao or whatever. And I read on the mm -hmm. forum that these pens are great and they're better than Blanc Blanc. You're a fanboy, all this. And I think that there's a lot of um, culture that develops within a forum sometimes. And I stay away from forums. I do use them for research on occasion, but I take it mm -hmm. with a grain of salt. Like I'll go to Google mm -hmm. and I'll look for results. Because I used to moderate a vintage clothing forum, and I, you get an, a sense for how these things work. As you said, someone will have a bad experience with a brand, and then they start saying it, and it becomes like an echo chamber, and it just reverberates around forever, where that mm -hmm. brand's reputation is bes besmirched within this very vocal, influ influential community. And... Mm -hmm. It's a shame because I had someone recently who was asking me about my experience with a certain pen brand that's extraordinary, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I have nine different iterations of their pens, and everyone is perfect. Mm -hmm. And the guy's like, well, I read in the forum that they're bad. I'm not buying one. And I was like, well, what do you yeah. me for then? Just, just get all your advice from the forum then. Yeah. So that's why it's essential for companies to always be – at the top of their game, right? Believe it or not, there's a lot of pressure for like, let's say like a brand like Pilot, right? I don't want to speak on behalf of them, but their products are so consistent out of the box. Their pens are phenomenal. But if they have one bad release, which I personally don't think they ever really have, but th that could really put a bad taste in, in someone's you mouth and they never use Pilot again. Like a bad model or a bad- A bad model or like a bad performing nib or maybe, I've you know, a batch bad. of nibs. I have had, I had my sure. first Metropolitan was, was another one. It was terrible. And so yeah. a lot of times when people ask like, what are your beginner pens? I recommend Kaveco Sport, uh, Twisby, mm -hmm. Eco, if you want the full experience and the Lamy Safari. And then if you mm -hmm. want to go really cheap, I go into Pilot Kakunos, which I really like. There you go. Beautiful Twisbys. But mm -hmm. I, a lot of folks would come, oh, yeah, I love those Lamis. I love the mismatch caps, and I love that so much. I'd have the defenders of the Metropolitan, and I get the, the value proposition of Metropolitan's great, but when my mm -hmm. first experience was bad with it, it's hard for me to recommend. I can't recommend mm -hmm. a pen to a beginner that I have to work on because mm -hmm. I think of a beginner that doesn't have access to this channel. They don't have access to whatever it is that I've learned over the past 30 years of doing this. And they're mm -hmm. going to get it and be like, fountain pens are terrible. This, what is the appeal? You know what They'll I mean? They'll never try another one again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think where the differentiation is, is you. <laughs> you. Mm -hmm. Because if you buy it from you and you have a problem, you, you know, anybody could call you and be like, mm -hmm. you know, I spent $300 in this pen. I'm so disappointed. It doesn't mm -hmm. write well, whatever. And you could help them. Whereas. Yeah, we'll, might, we'll get it um, fixed. We'll fix the problem you will fix the problem every time. And that's why I recommend people to you because I know how you do business. And I sound like I'm doing a commercial for you, but I'm not. <laughs> I guess maybe I am, but I'm trying not to. It's, it's just really important. And I think I told you that I had an influencer page over on Amazon where I could get a piece of every sale that was made. And I mm -hmm. linked it to all my channels, you know, because you're always looking to sort of support this. This is expensive, even this software, everything, you know? So yeah. I got rid of it because I ordered a couple things. And even though I was reading the descriptions of what people were getting and it seemed like they were good suppliers and everything else, I got some bum stuff and there was nothing mm -hmm. I could do about it. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't want people buying from me. I want people buying, you know, from Amazon through me. I want people buying mm -hmm. from you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And, and you know what? Amazon is obviously used by most people in the world. Uh, you know, I'm guilty of using Amazon. Uh, sure. they, they offer great services, great products. But when you're in such a niche market, you have to be careful of a few things. One, because when you're buying something off Amazon, it might not be them as the seller, right? There's an individual or a company listing on Amazon. And there are people that are able to counterfeit certain pens like, you know, the Lamy Safari, um, things like that, right? So what you were pushing is, is perfectly fine, right? Uh, but... Yeah. But Additionally, you're not quality control. Do you know what I mean? And and what happened yep. to me is I bought some ink and it was open when it arrived. And they oh, were what? like, we'll send it back. If you send it back, we'll give you a refund. 
and it's like it's broken pieces and ink everywhere like you want yeah. to mail how am i gonna mail that back and like i'm like you know covered in ink and and so i just threw it away and i was like okay well fine i'm taking that page down and that's what i did yeah yeah so so exactly though but like let's say you you buy this pen brand off amazon right there might not be a warranty applied to it because they're not technically an authorized seller. Could be a third party getting involved selling or listing on Amazon. Whereas if you if you purchase through an authorized retailer, your coverage is a lot better as you recommended or as you you suggested. And uh, the biggest thing with us is like, you know, we do our best to to stand out and, and obviously provide as good of customer service as possible. But our policy is is kind of you know we'll take care of you within thirty days, right? You know, yeah. we'll, we're, if it's defective, we'll handle it. You know, we, we don't want you reaching out to the manufacturer. Um, you know, I don't want you to have to reach out to you know Waterman in France to get something fixed. So our policy is typically within thirty days. But honestly, what we do is we most likely will just handle everything, right? We have great relationships with our vendors, so it's better just to have us take care of it, get the problem solved right away, send out a replacement, even if it's a couple months old, rather than the customer having a bad taste of, well, this, this $300 pen, you know, is defective. It broke in two months. And now I got to go talk to these guys in Japan to get it fixed and get it serviced. It, that can be a hassle. And we totally understand that. So. And let's face mm -hmm. it. I know people who have five fountain pens. I know people who have 500 fountain pens. Mm -hmm. No one has one. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, you get your you get your first one, and then your second one comes pretty quickly. <laughs> exactly. So John Manuel has a question for you. What's your favorite task in the shop? Okay, okay, that's one I've actually never been asked before. Nice. That's a very nice question. I appreciate you, you asking. Um. So there's a lot. I mean, my favorite thing is probably just interacting, whether it's like creating content and expressing a little bit of myself in the videos um, and also the interactions in the store. You know, the idea is these people who come into your shop are, are taking the time out of their day to come shop at your location. Wow. And it, it's very cool to see that, right? Everyone's time is very valuable. Time is money. We all know that. And uh, I like kind of just meeting new people and fast forward two, three years from now, they're a regular, I see them all the time. We, we exchange numbers or we're able to go grab a bite or something like that. And you must have regular, uh, you have the super fans and they come in and they buy a new pen like every few weeks and all that. Right. Yep. Yep. I kid you not. There's a, a gentleman named Ryan that comes in every Thursday super nice guy he came in one day randomly like a year or two ago and he brought in like a an abalone dip pen from the 1800s i was like dude oh my god like that's insane and uh he comes in ever since i met him that first time he's been coming in every thursday and so sometimes my days blend but i'll see him around the same time every thursday and i i've made the joke i'm like i, I forgot what day it was but once i saw you i knew it was thursday <laughs> good you now it's really nice because you're yeah. part of the community too like it's bigger than just the mm -hmm. store and that's sort yeah. of a bit that's lost with all of us mm -hmm. and i think too often buying a pen is very transactional and i think it's mm -hmm. nice when you have somebody like atlas stationers that stands behind it and everything else so, mm -hmm. so what's your next pen purchase Ah, tough. You know, being around so many fine writing instruments so frequently, I tend to be a little more selective. Um, obviously, I, I want them all. Obviously, uh, you know, they, they each have their own calling in a sense. Um, I, I pretty much, you know, my collection's pretty, pretty slim, but I own a lot of pens that, that I've been after for a while. You know, the Pelican, the Cross, uh, Visconti, Homo Sapiens. Oh, you have them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I actually have the uh, the the magma version, which is pretty cool. I got um, I have that's the one. I Say that again. That might be my next one. I think. Yeah. That's yeah, a, dude, it's it's a sweet pen. It's is sweet it? Pen. Yeah. Yeah, that because you know, I'm I'm super curious about. It. I've held it, and I dipped it, but I've never like inked and written with one. So. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I'll work on a little package and, and I could send you, you know, a, a few fun things to play around with. So um, maybe the Homo sapiens will be in there for you. Uh -oh. um, great pen, highly recommend it. I understand the value of it's a little higher in terms of price point, yeah. And a lot of people perceive it as a grail pen, but it's amazing. The, the lava rock, the nib, it's truly a, a work of art. Um, I would say 
What's up next on my list? Like, I don't really own any pens that are above like a thousand dollars. Most of my pens hover between like, well, obviously the entry level and then go up to about 800, 900. I would say a pen that I really, really love. And I think the design of it is just incredible. The designer behind it is an unbelievable um, designer. And that, that's the Paniter Psycho. Um, we got in one that's all black and it just is so slick. Uh, are you familiar with that one? Only that you gave it to your dad. Yeah, yeah. So he got the uh he got the silver, the palladium one. Okay. Well it's 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 all silver actually. Let me rephrase. So the entire outside is silver. It's in the pen case. Um, you know, I don't have time to grab it, but uh it's truly an it's unbelievable over pen. For that pen. Say that again, I'm it's sorry. A, it's over a thousand USD. Yeah. Yeah, it's closer to two, closer to two. Wow. That, um, and it, yeah, wow. Yeah, so uh, Dante Del Vecchio, the designer, it was actually a co-founder of Visconti, which I'm sure you know the story, right. um, separated from Visconti, then came to Paniter, which was uh, a super long-lasting stationary company since like the 1770s. And then back in like 2014-ish, he designed some pens. Well, he's the one who's responsible for like the Visconti Van Goghs, I'm pretty sure, the Homo uh -huh. Sapiens. Yeah, okay. All of that good stuff, which is, it, that's unique stuff. Like that's oh, new technology icons. and yeah. yeah. And they've quickly yeah. become icons and they're kind of must have pens for people's yep. collections. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I talk yeah. about a thousand. I don't have anything over a thousand. Mm -hmm. I feel like your, your Mont Blanc might be one of your more expensive ones. Yeah, it, it is. I have three. I have, um, of Mont mm -hmm. Blanc, uh, the Egyptomania is like nine and change. The one forty nine is like nine fifty, and then the um, one forty six with the calligraphy nib is in that same neighborhood. And then I have a Cartier sure. below that was originally around the grand. I've had that yeah. forever. Um, well, I've had the one forty nine forever too, and those are like yeah. those are my big powerhouse pens. So yeah, the Cartiers are pretty wild. Cartiers are pretty yeah. ballin' pens. It's heavy though. Yeah, most are. I think a lot of them are actually like like nine twenty five silver. Oh, nice. So yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't mess around, but um, you know, some Cartier pens are like five hundred thousand dollars. Like some. <laughs> uh, have you seen them? Because no, you, that's a little out of website. my price point. <laughs> go, to, go to Cartier's website and just um, put in fountain pen. You'll see like. I think they have a black Diablo now. Mine's Chinese lacquer, which was nicer than the black. Um, sure. And that's like around a thousand or something. And then they'll have yeah. one that's like the Cartier Panther and it's like embracing the pen and it's all hand done and everything. And it'll be, wow. It'll be like 500 grand, something like that. I mean, I might be, it's in the six figures. So, you know, it's ridiculous, but. Yeah. So the most expensive pens that we typically carry, like, like as, as we've evolved and, and as we've grown, we obviously didn't start out with, you know, thousand dollar pens. We started at, you know, below a couple hundred. Then eventually I remember we got like the Lamy Emporium and like the Paniter La Gran Valletta. Those are like $400 pens, $500 pens. I couldn't believe it. I was like, how are we going to sell these? Like, these are such a, a yeah. big, heavy hitting pen. Yeah. And then, you know, you slowly start integrating more with the community, building your following. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have $5,000 pens and those have been moving pretty quickly, right? The Monte Grappas, things like that. And now we've got an $8,000 pen and then we have a, a like a $13,000 pen coming to us. So we're slowly breaking those, those barriers, right? Those filters and like, you know, who's to say we won't be carrying 25 to $30,000 pens, but a $500,000 pen, man, that's crazy. Yeah, they're crazy. I don't. I think they only sell them through themselves because they're a jeweler. Makes sense. But, um, yeah. What do you think is the best value in a pen? Um, in terms of like the qualities, or just the uh, the best value pen out there? Yeah, like, well, yeah, exactly. The best value out there that you put out X amount of dollars and you really get a lot for whatever that is. Sure, I think. Uh, Twisbees for sure. I think that's the most common answer. You can't go wrong with the Twisby. Thirty dollar um, eco. The thirty dollar pen gets you everything you could possibly need. The entire and, experience in thirty bucks. Yep. Yep. It, it's amazing. Um, I would say um, working your way up. The Lamy two thousand is is a pretty mm -hmm. popular one. That one's tough to beat. 
Um, one of the all-time go-tos, you're well aware of this, the, the Pilot Custom A23. That's got to be one of the best pens of all time. I got to be honest with, with you. These are very common answers, but they're, 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 good. they're answers good. that they're good answers. Yeah. It, there's a reason everyone says these pens, yep. you know, as an answer to that type of question, but maybe a more uh, abstract answer. Um, I've found a lot of, of good luck with Paniders with their avatar model. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they just released some brand new uh, semi-transparent models. They just released their their first ever vacuum filler model. Oh, look at um, that! Very nice. Yeah, big fan of them. Um, Esther Brook. Esther Brook's been doing great things. You know, with their their SDs. They're a great um, gift pen. You know. Yep. Esther Brook is so gorgeous, and and you get so much out of it for the price. Yeah, there you go. Yep. That's a good one. I have one that I would add to the list is the uh, Pilot E ninety five S, especially in the mm -hmm. burgundy and the ivory. I think you get a lot with that. You get a a gold nib for around, I think it's retail about 130. Um, the, yep. <laughs> the converter, I think it's the Con 40 in there, isn't it? So it's basically- it's a, the, the, most, the most loved converter in the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I always spin it like, hey, you know, you don't, you can change your ink a lot. It's, um, it's a plus, mm -hmm. but it is a very interesting gold nib in that pen. Mm -hmm. It's got a bit of flex. It's fun to write with. It um, kind of shows you what gold can do at a very low price point. Yeah, and uh, it's got that inlaid nib too, which is pretty nice. I, I actually got one right here that I'll show oh, off real quickly. Um, I think it black. Ooh, uh, it's, you know. Yeah, black with gold. So I think it is actually the the least expensive, like mass produced gold nib pen you can find from any major brand. Um, yeah, about one hundred thirty, one hundred forty dollars. Um, it pays homage to a lot of the vintage style pens, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, it reminds me, it's a bit like a Kareen or a uh, Schaefer mm -hmm. Legacy. It's sort of in that neighborhood with the inlaid nib. The only problem I yep. have, it, tell me if this happens to you, gorgeous. Sometimes when you're writing with it, doesn't it sometimes feel a little rickety? Almost like the like it wants to unpost while you're writing? Yeah, um, so I think that's due to it being a snug fit, right? So yeah. some, some brands they'll, they'll have like little, little lips on the back where it like, it's like a ledge, it clicks in or um, it threads in. But with this, the whole idea of this pen is like, I mean, the cap is almost longer than the, the pen itself. Right. So I would say over time that, that can definitely happen. I mean, how long have you had yours? I don't know. I don't remember. I think probably only about a year, but I do write with it a lot. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, it's kind of feeling like it's, it's not as snug anymore. Yeah. I, I, that's something that happens with me. It happens with me with Banu too. Do you guys carry Banu? Sure. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. If yeah. You post those perfectly. They'll sort of roll away in your hand while you're, mm -hmm. or at least in my hand while I write with it. I'm, I'm thinking of brown. So, yeah, I don't think the Benu pens post as deep. I don't think they go down the barrel as deep. They kind of sit more up top near the back end, in which like they, they definitely aren't as fitting as as other pens out there. Um, you know, just as an example, like like this avatar goes down really deep, and you can kind of push it in to where you know you can't you can't post it anymore. And it's like it takes a lot of pressure to actually like get that off. Oh so, yeah. Well, that's the other extreme. Have you ever had a pen? my um pelican m200 the cap mm -hmm. is a jerk I, I gotta use clean language on this <laughs> like i clip it into my pocket and it's like houdini it just undoes itself and then it's yeah. like rattling around your pocket and before you know it you have like a black stain like somebody shot you but it's black and then the other thing that happens is when i write with it you post it and then you write for a while. Then you want to take it off. And suddenly you're like, I can't get this. Uh, it get gets it stuck. Off. Like twist it just to break the yeah. seal. It, it's really persnickety in that sense. So, mm -hmm. I think that's just due to the fact that like the, um, like here's one right here, right? Sure. I think it's like the, the threads are good. They're smooth, but they're just like looser if that makes sense. I think it's only a three quarter turn or something to get it out. I think they were trying to get the balance of making it a little quicker with the screw. So yeah, I, I think it's either, I think it's less than a full turn. Oh, get... it, it's for it's definitely yeah. less. Yeah, yeah. it's but for sure less. It has its downsides. Like I tell people, don't click it to your shirt. 
you know, put it in a bag <laughs> or something because it's like Houdini. They'll try to get away. That's where the ox blood comes in handy, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sincerely. <laughs> Have a nice little uh, bullet wound in your, your breast pocket. <laughs> truly, truly. Well, I think we've gone on pretty long, my friend. I, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I, I usually try to keep this under an hour. And um, I don't have a timer going, but I'm thinking we're probably a, like an hour and 20. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to wear you out. But uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Um, mm -hmm. I hope you'll come back again. Oh, of course. Of course. This is, this is just fun, man. Like, it is, right? like it, it's, it's very cool how, how nonchalant and how, how we have the ability to just carry a conversation. And I, I really appreciate that. So you, you've been a great host and it's truly a pleasure. So. No, I appreciate it. It's great to have you. You're one of the best people in this business. It's always a pleasure to talk. Thank you. I'm glad we're friends, man. I really am. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, I wanted to kind of uh, extend to you an offering. Um, you know, we, we wanted to send you um, one of our inks, our exclusive inks, so you can have one as we feel like you would appreciate and understand the, the history aspect of it. But um, we're also going to send a second one that you can give away on any channel of yours, whether it's YouTube, TikTok. Um, that way, you know, it might be a little fun to, to get some of the community involved. So if you're down for that, we'd love to, to get a little package sure. out your way. Yeah, yeah, that'd be lovely. Thanks. I'm sure people would love that. Good, good. Well, good. I'm glad to hear. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. You're very kind. You're the best. Ladies and gentlemen, Brandon Schmidt from Atlas. Thank you. Take care, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Peace. Peace. Well, everyone, I thought that was pretty great. He is truly one of the nicest guys in this business and a very interesting dynamic speaker. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we'll have him back again very soon. Just to do some quick channel updates, we have a new video coming out on Thursday on the Flex Nib from Esterbrook. So I think you guys need to see that because you might end up picking up an Esterbrook this um, holiday season with the Flex Nib and you want to um, get a sense of what it's like. So it's a pretty nice video. I also filmed it in Newport, Rhode Island. So I'm continuing the trend of sort of going somewhere and mixing it in with the uh, review. Also, the Conway Stewart um, pen is here. I'm filming with it right now. It is a thing of beauty. Look at that. It's like someone was able to reconstruct a vintage pen perfectly. It's just so much fun. So you'll see more on that soon. I'm editing that. So lots of really fun, exciting stuff coming up on the channel. We'll have some more interviews with some more exciting people. I'd like to bring to you some journalers, perhaps. And um, I, I want to keep it not just on fountain pens, but also on journaling and writing and storytelling. And just whatever it is, it's going to keep you engaged, keep you inspired to keep on writing. So I think you'll like that so much. I hope you guys enjoyed this live as much as I did. It's been fantastic. I love spending time with you all. I hope you'll consider joining the channel. And also, if you're watching this and you're watching this on a regular basis, even if you're hate watching me, consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate it. It helps the channel a great deal. And when I went on the air, I had 3,998 people following along. I'd love to get over 4,000. I mean, it's two people. So if you're out there, just click the button if you would. I'd really appreciate it. Get me to 4,000. So um, I see lots of love for Brendan. I appreciate it so much. I appreciate all of you, especially my members. Thanks for supporting this channel. I'm probably going on too long, so I'm going to say my goodbyes. Thank you all very much. We'll see each other again Thursday at noon for the Esther Brooke Flex Nib video. Take care.